Paul Basics is going to take us on a virtual bird and conservation journey through one of my favorite countries, Cuba. You may know him as the co-editor of the popular monthly Birding Community eBulletin. Paul has spent decades engaged in bird conservation and writing about birds. He's worked for the American Birding Association as Director of Conservation and Public Policy, along with editing 14 of their ABA Bird Finding Guides. He's co-authored numerous books, including a guide to the nest eggs and nestlings of North American birds, a book on the history of backyard bird feeding, and a guide to waterfowl. Paul is passionate about bird conservation and the breeding biology of North American birds. He leads bird tours and workshops and most recently is concentrating on Cuba. Paul will be joined later in the presentation by his colleague Soledad Payuca, who organizes people to people delegations to Cuba on birds and conservation as well as art and music. She previously worked in the area of human rights issues in Central America. And now, Paul, thank you so much for being here, and we're ready to begin our Cuba tour. Thank you, Molly. Uh, it's a delight to be here. And as you indicated, our, our talk tonight uh, is on birding and beyond. And by the way, Bev, you're, you're not muted, so you might want to mute yourself um, in any case. I want to mute yourself. Or, and, and Susan also. In any case, I'm going to take us uh, to a journey uh, through Cuba. Mm -hmm. The important thing is to, to stress the opportunities and lessons, and I'll be aided by my co-conspirator Sole later on in the talk. Although Sole is welcome to interrupt me if I say something particularly wrong or uh, uh, in the presentation. Uh, this is a photo here. This is a photo here, which is a good start of uh, of um, a number of us in the in uh, uh, the Bay of Pigs area, uh, Playa Larga. We're in uh, the best location to see the smallest bird in the world. Uh, we are all watching um, uh, bee hummingbirds. And It says that I'm keeping, uh, you're muting me constantly. Um, am I being muted? Can you hear me, Molly? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, but I'm, I'm being turned off occasionally. Anyhow, um, in the group is Soleil over here, our uh, tour leader, our group leader, our, our uh, leader for the birds and science element, uh, Michael here, our bus driver, Ronell over here, and here's my old friend, uh, Larry Balch, former president of the American Birding Association. I point these people out to you because this is about our interaction with the birds and the people uh, of Cuba who are making conservation and bird life safer and better. Um, trying to move to the next, okay, fine. Um, also, uh, it's about the birds. And this is one of my best photos. I'm a terrible photographer. You don't see that. And my photographs are framed in black. So you'll know to ignore them because their quality is not the best. But this is one of the uh, best of my photos. It's a Cuban trogon. It's the national bird of Cuba. And it represents our interaction with the people uh, with whom we have engagement. Uh, let's see. Ah, yes. And these are the people uh, also in uh, Playa Larga, among the people. These represent our counterparts. From the left, um, we have Michael Canizares, the former president of the Zoological Society of Cuba. Um, in the, next to him in the blue shirt is Rosendo Martinez. He's former head of visitor engagement of the National Park System of Cuba. He's now retired and deeply engaged in what we would call abotourism and education. Next to him is Ronel, our bus driver. A good bus driver is worth his weight in gold or her weight in gold for that matter in Cuba. They know the best places to go, the best stops, the best places to find gasoline, etc. 
And next to him is uh, Adrian Comas. He's a local um, birder, but uh, just as importantly, he's a local birder in Playa Larga, the Bay of Pigs. He has a, fab a fabulous Casa Particular, or Casa de Renta, or what we would call a homestay, or a uh, Airbnb, which is packed full of birds. More on that later. You will see that these pictures of interaction are framed in green as a guide to us. Uh, the black pictures are mine. The green, the, the green frames are interaction with our counterparts, and the red frames are those pictures that aren't mine and that uh, I borrowed from colleagues. We're going to visit three core locations in our journey. The Vinales area, general area, the Zapata Swamp, which I gave you a little peek on, and Havana. And after, those are the core places, the best places for birds, the Vinales and, and Zapata area. But I'm taking us also on four side trips, which are very difficult to do on one journey to Cuba. You have to go to multiple visits to Cuba to go to Guanajaca Vives or the North Coast, where there are a number of all-purpose and all-inclusive resorts, uh, Baracoa, which is Sole's favorite point uh, location on the east tip of Cuba, and Topes de Cayantes, which is a um, uh, national park area. So here's Cuba. You all know it's about uh, two-thirds the size of uh, Florida. If you cut off Florida from uh, uh, Jacksonville uh, westward, you get a uh, kind of like uh, the size of, uh, of Cuba. Um, it's 42,000 square miles. It's the same size as Virginia or Tennessee. It's 770 uh, miles long. It's the home to six terrestrial ecoregions, including moist forests, dry forests, pine forests, Cuban wetlands, very important, cactus shrub, uh, greater Antillean mangroves, and about 20% of the island is preserved as natural areas. Very important. According to the official census of about a dozen years ago, Cuba's population is about 11.2 um, million people, um, half and half. 5.6 million men, 5.6 million, million women, its birth rate, uh, 9.88 births per thousand population, um, about 15 years ago, is one of the lowest in the Western Hemisphere. And Havana itself has about 2.2 million people in Havana. Ethnic makeup is complicated. A study done nine years ago found that uh, genetic ancestry in Cuba is about 72% European, 20% African, 8% indigenous with uh, Asians, that is uh, Chinese and Japanese, for instance, about 1%. Bird species, which is one of the main concerns that we have, um, are fascinating. 394 endemic uh, species, rather, have uh, been on the island, or just short of 400. It may have gone up in a couple of years. There are about 26, 28 endemics. 22% or 85% of them are in some trouble or of uh, national or international concern. Among them, and this is a artwork from a book I'll uh, we'll bring to your attention, artwork by Niels Navarro, uh, among them are my, uh, some of my favorites, such as Bee Hummingbird number four here, and Cuban Blackhawk number eight, Zapata Wren um, number 18, Cuban Toey, Toady um, number 12, and Cuban Trogon number 11. So let's start our little journey. And uh, we have landed in Havana. You virtually have to land in Havana these days when you're visiting Cuba. And we've gone, we've gone west, westward to the Vinales area over here. The green spots are significant uh, national parks or national reserves. <clears throat> In the Vinales area, it's well known for these mogotes. They're haystack mountains, limestone karst, which are in Cuba, and I believe in Southeast Asia, perhaps, and correct me if I'm wrong, it may be Thailand of all places <laughs> where these geological formations are quite unique and they have some real biological significance. The life lives on a couple of these karsts, these, these uh, limestone uh, haystack mountains 
uh, can be uh, very different from uh, the uh, botanical and uh, uh, invertebrate life uh, two uh, haystacks away. So it's really very interesting. So having arrived in Cuba and we're in, in the Vinales area, a few hours to the west, we might have an introduction to uh, Cuban trogon or Cuban pygmy owl. Pygmy owls on the right and on the left, as you see, bordered in black is one of my fabulous photos. If you can find the trogon in there, you're pretty good. I'll give you some help, it's right over there. <laughs> There's the Cuban trogon, and this is about the quality of most of my photographs. But also in the Vinales area, general area, uh, we have a uh, yellow-headed warbler on the left, which is an endemic, and uh, West Indian woodpecker. Uh, it is a regional endemic, not only on Cuba, but uh, other islands. It may look familiar to some of us because it looks like a uh, red-bellied woodpecker, even with a little red belly there. Um, with a black eye, like somebody punched it in the eye. It's a nifty bird, and we see it regularly on, on our trips. Where we might stay um, in the Vinales area here, uh, in the valley, uh, overlooking the, 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 the town. We might stay in a hotel like this, with uh, our back doors on little porches. We may have gone past uh, traditional tobacco drying barns like this one here. These are my photos. And this one photo on the left is a bird, which is a very important one. Uh, it looks like uh, a uh, washed out hermit thrush that has been washed and dried. It's um, Cuban solitaire and has one of the most, uh, it's one of the dullest thrushes that you've ever seen with one of those, the most magnificent songs that you've ever heard. And we'll see them, we'll hear them uh, more often than we see them, but we do track them down. Look, also in the Vinales area is the area of uh, Las Terrazas. It's a reforestation project that started in 1968, uh, UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, and an eco village of uh, Terrazas. Um, it's a wonderful place to, to be. Uh, we stay here uh, at the Hotel Moca which for me is a great introduction. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of native plants around there and birds and right in front is uh, a bird feeding station. By the way, here we are on the left with our friend Ernesto Ruelas uh, doing our checklist at the end of the day. But uh, here on the left, on the right rather, you can see uh, a bird feeder right here. It's a hummingbird feeder. The staff in good times, keeps the hummingbird feeder filled with corn, cracked corn, sometimes other seeds, and the hummingbird feeder filled with uh, hummingbird type syrup to attract uh, the hummingbirds. And what are the feeders uh, like? Well, here they are. These may look familiar to you. Um, these are feeders that are impossible to find in Cuba. They are $1. <laughs> feeders that you get at your dollar store. And uh, they're invaluable to our colleagues, our counterparts on the island. And uh, we bring a bunch of them to the island. At Las Terrazas, um, we have a number of birds that we um, pursue. And they are including olive cap warbler on the left, not unlike um, yellow-throated warbler in terms of its pine habitat engagement. Um, the Cuban vireo below, which is an endemic, these are three endemics, by the way, and um, the Cuban green woodpecker, which to me, I love woodpeckers, but it always reminds me that its bill is rather short for a woodpecker, having been chiseled down, working too much on uh, the wood, but who knows? Another regional endemic of uh, Cuba, Mexico, Central America, and Northern South America is the red-legged honey creeper here. Here's the male. So uh, that's uh, some of the birds that we'll see in the, in the Vinales area. Uh, we do serious birding there. And then we break off after we've gotten a good feel for an introduction to Cuban bird, Cuban culture. Uh, some of our friends who, might, who live there, like uh, Niels Navarro, 
in that area and an introduction to the scene. Uh, we'll take a uh, drive down to, I'm sorry, the Vinales area also is the area uh, where there is um, Via Sora, which is one of the hotels. I put this in there, if only because uh, there's a loggerhead keyboard on the sign there for us to see. And the loggerhead kingbird is not unlike uh, the gray kingbird that's in Florida, uh, but it has um, uh, some more um, heft to it, let's put it that way. Also in the Vinales area, I, I neglected to say this, is the Saroa Orchid Garden. It's a botanical garden, a terrific old botanical garden, a little steep climbing up the trail there, but it's a wonderful place to get introduced to these birds, which I already uh, showed you. Uh, now we'll uh, leave Vinales and move to the Zapata Swamp area. We will have uh, started in Havana. We went to Vinales, and now we're in this green area here, a few hours drive, a green area of uh, the Zapata Swamp. The Zapata Swamp area is very interesting insofar as it's a national park. It's a biosphere reserve. It's a Ramsar complex. It's not unlike... Uh, in some respects, um, where we have nearby us, um, Maryland folks, the uh, Chincoteague National Seashore next to Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. They have different status. They have different jurisdictions and, and uh, uh, management, but they're mixed into a complex. Or it's not unlike, perhaps in some places in the West, uh, where you have a national forest, and there might be right next to it a national monument, and uh, embedded in that national forest, there may be sprinkled three, four, five little towns. And those of you who have birded out west will understand that. That's the way I kind of relate to the Zapata Swamp complex. It's not unlike those, as we'll see. Um, this is the road we've taken from uh, Havana and Vinales up there and come down to the Bay of Pigs over here. Uh, we will come down the road here and concentrate on Playa Larga with some visits to Las Salinas, which is like an Everglades route, if you've been to our Everglades, or we'll um, be to um, Bermejas in this general area for other birds, and we'll take a special trip up here into the depths of the uh, Zapata Peninsula, into the Zapata Swamp, to Santo Tomas to find uh, a couple of really special birds. So this is our location. We stay here, Playa Larga, and here's the entrance with a giant crab uh, inviting us in to the town. The town in the best of times is quite busy. Uh, we have some of our birders over here on the left. Uh, it's uh, prosperous in, in the best of times when there's not COVID. It's prosperous. There are these little bicycle taxi cabs uh, taking folks around uh, one end of the town to the other. Maybe it's about a mile and a half long, the town, and a few streets, streets, streets deep uh, between uh, the swamp on the north and the bay on the south. And uh, Sprinkled in here are a number of uh, Airbnbs, like uh, this over here, these casas particulares, these Airbnbs or homestays. And uh, there's also a couple of interesting formal restaurants, like the Tiki restaurant, which you'll see at the very end. And, um, and there's also um, Palerares, which are family restaurants. Typical of the places we stay, and this was one of our delegations, there's Soleil in the background. This is the Casa del Sol, the House of the Sun, and uh, it's an Airbnb. And it, as you'll see typically here in this particular town, the second story is often under construction. They're adding details, they're adding more rooms. Why? Because this area is popular for European tourists for snorkers in particular, it's a big, it's a big deal. And we'll also visit uh, more snorkeling places later on. 
Here is one of the ba basic and best Casas Particulares Airbnbs, the Casa Ana here. Here's our friend, um, Adrian, with me a couple of years ago. And here he is uh, holding up one of the feeders uh, that uh, we brought for him. It's important to realize that when Adrian got this particular house to the north edge of uh, town, that is on the, north, the next north street, the back of the house was basically a dump. People had used it for garbage. There were tires there. There was all kinds of stuff. Adrian cleaned the whole place out, rearranged uh, some of the trails, which are uh, up against water coming into the bay, uh, and created a bird feeding station of great quality. That's why I have it in green. And that was the very first shot that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. He'll have visiting him um, a number of uh, warblers and stuff like uh, black throated blue warbler and parallel and yellow faced grass quits, which you'll, you may see here. And uh, you can sit here all day with your camera and have a wonderful time. And indeed, it's a wonderful place for, uh, it's one of the best places now in the country to see a uh, bee hummingbird right in front of you. It's fabulous. But the town is also the gateway to uh, the national park, the Grand Parque Nacional Montemayor. It's an Everglades-like park. It's that road that I showed you on the map down to Las Salinas. It's um, very much like the coastal refuges that we have on um, from Everglades National Park to the refuges. Uh, on the East Coast in in uh, the Southern United States and in, into the uh, uh, North Carolina coast. And uh, there are some really interesting birds here, including, lo and behold, um, flamingos. Also in the uh, Zapata Swamp, uh, in this particular part of the road going down to Las Salinas, lots of snail kites you can see, both the males here and the immatures and females here. But the bird where the raptor we're looking for here is not necessarily the wonderful snail kite, though it is terrific. We're looking for Cuban black hawk. And you can see in my fabulous picture on the left, there's the Cuban black hawk. Obvious to anyone who's looking. Yes, it's right there. But uh, we were lucky enough that we got closer to the bird right above our bus uh, in this shot here. It's, it's a hefty budio which uh, feasts um, on crabs and other uh, swamp um, and marsh-like um, cuisine. Uh, there are a couple of um, uh, places where we stop and go up onto a uh, observation platform. Uh, here's uh, our group plus another group um, who was coming down the road to Salinas, looking at a number of birds there. We're talking about... Uh, long-legged waders and shorebirds. I mean, the waders are terrific, besides the flamingos. Uh, reddish egrets and egrets, herons, it's terrific. Shorebirds, waterfowl, gulls, terns, raptors like this. Uh, and at the very end, clapper rails and sometimes Virginia rails. Also, it's a great place to be. Um, it's worthy of a few hours drive down and a few hours drive back. It's a really very special trip. Another place we go in the interior, on the eastern interior of uh, the swamp area, is Bermeja. This is the entrance to the, uh, uh, as it says, uh, the uh, wildlife refuge of Bermeja. And uh, we've just left. And what did we uh, just uh, leave seeing? Well, we saw um, Cuban parrot as we entered. And when we followed the trail down the path into the uh, Bermeja, location, we reached a wooden wall. And behind the wooden wall, our host, who's over here, by the way, uh, who is the manager of the uh, location, the host seeds the place with cracked corn an hour or two before we show up. And we got get to start to see blue-headed quail doves right over this wooden wall where we're taking pictures. This is one of my fabulous pictures. Here's another one. And not only is this on the other, taken on the other side of the wooden wall, where we're 
enjoying the sight. But some of them will even come around, have learned to come around the wall and are virtually at our feet. It's just amazing. And besides the uh, blue-headed quail dove over the side of the wall and at our feet, gray-fronted quail dove um, is another specialty of that particular place. It's great. And as we leave, we also will find Cuban parakeets, um, a bird which we'll probably discuss later. As I mentioned earlier, there are towns embedded in this natural complex. The town of um, Playa Larga is the largest and most significant, full of uh, the tourists who are doing snorkeling and scuba diving and just visiting and swimming, more of that later. Um, but also, um, there are other little towns. There's the little town of Alpite, which is a great location also to find some birds at our friend Bernabe's backyard. He started, discovered that uh, he could uh, attract uh, bee hummingbirds and other birds in his backyard. And here's one of our visits, uh, our bus, our little bus with about eight to 12 people and other folks. And here's one of our feeders, notice the field marks, um, looking at the, the uh, trees for um, bee hummingbird, uh, Cuban emerald and others. And here's Bernabe and his wife. And this is what we brought uh, to his location, to Adrian's location, to other places where we visit. Yeah, these were uh, 24 um, box, 24 feeders. They only cost us 24 bucks a piece. Uh, from a uh, dollar store, and they're like gold in Cuba. Also, in Bernabe's backyard, here we are, uh, Ernesto, Bernabe, and myself a few years ago, I think this was 2018, we're putting together this humbug feeder. You, this is a variation of the hummingbird feeder. You, what you do is you put in fruit, particularly bananas, and the openings, uh, the fruit flies come in, and lay their eggs. And uh, the fruit flies love this particular kind of feeder. And uh, rather than just having a humming, standard hummingbird feeder with, with the sugar solution, uh, there's a more meaty meal available for the hummingbirds. And here is my fabulous shot of a bee hummingbird. And by the way, I put this in green because this shows our interaction and our interrelationship with our Cuban colleagues and friends. Uh, the bee hummingbird, yes, you'll get a better look like here. Uh, this is a wonderful shot of uh, male and female bee hummingbird. And here is a picture two years later of the humbug um, in 2020. It was up and it was active and it was attracting both Cuban emerald and bee hummingbirds uh, for the uh, juicy flies that were circulating. Here's Ben and Bay holding up one of the little feeders that we brought. Yes. Um, and that's a bee hummingbird going to it right then and there. Um, this is a picture that our friend Nana Roya made. That's my hand over the, my left hand there holding up the hummingbird feeder for bee hummingbird. And here's a classic picture of, on the right of bee hummingbird on the tip of a pencil, which gives you the idea of the size of this smallest bird in the world. Also in Benjamin's backyard, we can find other birds such as uh, Cuban Oriole and, and others. Another location that we go to, I told you, we go to Santo Tomas on the other side of Playa Larga. It's a hour, hour and a half drive in a bus on this dirt road. Yeah, fairly slow, but reasonable road. And we go to the town of Santo Tomas. Here's the little town of Santo Tomas, the school. And by the way, all the schools in Cuba, not only do they fly the Cuban flag, they have the bust of Jose Marti, the uh, national hero of uh, Cuba and the national poet of Cuba, among other things. And here's the uh, sign for the, uh, the shop of Santo Tomas and there, large mural of the Zapata wren, the Ferminia, um, which is the bird we're pursuing. From the town of Santo Tomas, oh yes, by the way, yes. Here is the uh, school here at Santo Tomas with the 
Um, uh, the doctor who comes and visits regularly, the school teacher, two school teachers, and the few kids who go to the school there is our leader, Michael, talking to them. Here's the school classroom. And we brought them a whole bunch of stuff from crayons to coloring books, bird coloring books, uh, to other things. This particular term since then has been, especially during the COVID period, has been depopulated. And maybe Soli can clarify what that, what that means, because the last time we went there, most of the people had been moved to Playa Larga with the exception of a few folks who stayed there. So what do we do there? We get on these boats uh, that are pushed by poles. The locals take us out in two, three, or four of these boats out on this particular um, uh, kind of boat highway, one might, one might call it, um, to, to a location oh, about an hour out, maybe a half hour out, to one or two of the locations where we go on a boardwalk and we wait to see, to hear first, and then see the Ferminia, the um, Zapata Wren. And by the way, on the way out, we also often encounter another endemic, the Zapata Sparrow. Uh, by the way, that, that, uh, that canal was built in 1919 to help supply the village, both with incoming goods and outgoing lumber and charcoal and other things. Anyhow, we're here in the platform and we wait and we wait. And here's Ernesto. He's, he plays uh, the tape, as I say, in old fashioned. He plays a recording of the Firminia. Don't worry, these birds are not over taped because maybe a visitation of birders and biologists show up once a week or once every two or three or four weeks. And we wait and we wait and we play and we wait. 10, 15, 20 minutes later, they appear. Uh, my wonderful photos of Zapata Wren here and one singing in. Uh, competition with our recording here. You get to see a better view right there. There's, there's the beastie in question, um, a photo by David Beebe. To me, the Zapata wren resembles in shape and form a cactus wren, a little smaller and duller, uh, but it is, of course, uh, endemic to the island and Zapata swamp in particular. After an exhausting day out to Santo Tomas and back, we might come back to our digs at uh, Playa Larga. I'm oh, sorry, one other thing I forgot to mention. Here we are returning. Um, I guess this was 2016. Uh, Ernesto here is giving our uh, uh, gondoliers, for want of a better word, our, our friends who are taking us out to see the Zapata Wrens a bunch of baseball hats. Baseball is a big deal in Cuba, as most of you clearly know. Uh, and this was the year after I think the Cubs won uh, the series and we had a couple of, of uh, Chicago Cubs fans uh, on the trip with us and they brought the hats to distribute uh, to our colleagues there. Baseball hats, it was really good. So. Uh, when we come back, we'll uh, take a rest before we have dinner. Uh, we might go for a dip um, near our digs on the left, or we might take a detour to go to one of the cenotes, one of the um, sunken um, limestone sunken ponds or, or pools um, in, in Zapata Swamp for a uh, swim. And, uh, not all of us go and do that, but it is a uh, sight to behold and a real joy to, to engage in that, uh, particularly with our colleagues. Um, well, after we do the Zapata Swamp, we stay there for a few days, easily a few days to get a good feel for the areas from Mejas to San Tomas to uh, Palopite to other areas um, around the swamp area we go back to Havana to wrap up our trip. If that's all we're doing. And Havana is extremely important. You can't visit Cuba without visiting Havana. Some of the um, old cars, I think I see a Buick, a couple of Chevys, a 
film is uh, yeah right here from the 50s <coughs> maybe from the 40s uh, and uh, the, the rehabilitation of old buildings occurring here or the um, present old presidential palace which is now a museum of the revolution here's a typical street with uh, i think an oldsmobile mid 50s oldsmobile this i think i did in took this picture in 2015, 14. And here are the digs where my wife and I were staying um, uh, in Havana Street. And there back there is the Capitolio. It's the shape and slim of, of uh, the US Capitol, but uh, much slimmer. When we visit Havana, yeah, we do see birds. We go to the uh, Hotel Nacional, which is the famous hotel here. Uh, we go for some drinks in the back. Here's our driver, Ronel. His, my friend, the former president of the ABA, Larry Balch, and uh, birds will be at our feet, uh, like uh, the red-legged thrush of, uh, of Cuba. Uh, but we're doing good work there too. We'll visit uh, the um, uh, um, University of Havana. Here's our friend Alieni and Lourdes working uh, in biology and education for young people. And they've stepped onto the bus as we stop by their offices to pick up coloring books. Um, they're doing uh, education of, uh, with young kids, having to do with uh, urban, uh, suburb, so-called suburban birds in and around Havana. Here's a picture of my daughter in 2006 on the steps of um, the University, of, the famous steps of the University of Havana, by the way. And the buildings are fabulous. They're interesting in, diff in different stages of repair or disrepair. They can be as lovely as this or as broken down as that. They can have a old front face with a new interior. I think this is a joint venture hotel, elite hotel from with some French company or Italian company, I can't recall which, or there'll be old uh, buildings that are in uh, stages of, uh, of repair and redesign like uh, this one here. Uh, we can stay at a, a, a Airbnb situation and we did, we were on the third floor and fourth floor here, across the way from the Museum of the Revolution, the old um, uh, palace, um, presidential palace. Um, from here, here is Soleil in, in one of our digs, where we, sh where we were in, a couple of us were in two or three different uh, bedrooms and a kitchen for ourselves. And by the way, here's a, a view from uh, our Casa Particular, um, our Airbnb down to the, tank and the, uh, and the museum. Um, fear not, there are birds in Havana. And there's some interesting birds in Havana. And they could be um, brown pelicans in the harbor or, or royal terns or um, Antillean palm swift or Cuban martins. Uh, we usually see all of these and other birds, including, by the way, uh, yes, uh, Eurasian colored doves arrived in Havana a few decades ago and they're everywhere. Walking along the, uh, the uh, Malecon, the pathway along the harbor, and we uh, were able to look for some uh, water birds and as well as viewing the famous Castillo of the, of, uh, the harbor. And uh, if we have the opportunity, uh, either when we're approaching Havana, we sometimes take a detour uh, before we get into Havana to the um, National Botanical Gardens right here. It's uh, 500 hectares, about 4,000 plant species. It's 23 or 25 kilometers outside of Havana. Uh, it's very undervisited. Um, the meadowlark there and the meadowlark in Cuba is perhaps, as Niels Navarro will tell you, a um, species to be. It's non-migratory, it has a different song, and it has some uh, uh, plumage differentiation from Eastern Meadowlark. So we put that in our escrow account for species. It's a terrific place to visit. Unfortunately, the last time Soli and I were there with a delegation, um, it was closed because uh, the workers who work in uh, doing maintenance and, and care at the um, botanical gardens were unable to reach the botanical gardens from downtown Havana because of fuel shortages and they shut the place down. Hopefully they'll be open uh, in the near future. There's some nifty birds there. 
American kestrels. You will notice a very interesting, there are two flavors, both in, in, in Cuba of the native um, American kestrels, uh, two Cuban forms, one which are rufous breasted and the other one which is a light breasted form. And here is a pair of them together. Uh, my first trip to the uh, Jardin, the botanical gardens, uh, I met one of the workers here with his motorcycle. That's far away. Yes, it is a Soviet era motorcycle which he was repairing. The Cubans are very skilled in repairing their automobiles and their, their motor bikes uh, as necessary. But, uh, also at the um, botanical gardens is a wonderful set of ferns and a, uh, uh, a little restaurant there also. Well, we, need, we bump into some neat birds there like uh, common gallinules, smooth-billed annies, annies, and great lizard cuckoos, which we've seen previously, but it doesn't hurt. So that takes care of our core visit. If you go multiple times to Cuba, you can slip one of these into your itinerary, or you'll have to make another visit to, to Cuba to go to one of these locations, one of these four side trips, Guanajacamillas on the west coast, the north coast areas here, where there are uh, resorts and some unique birds there, uh, the Baracoa area on the eastern tip of Cuba, and Topes de Cayantes over here, some mountain areas. And we'll make a quick visit to all of those. First, Guanajacamillas is particularly important as a migration uh, launching pad. You can imagine uh, the end of, uh, of, of uh, Florida above here, and the the keys swinging down toward uh, toward Cuba. Uh, a number of our migrant birds, particularly um, raptors, will follow the keys and launch themselves across the uh, Gulf of Mexico before they reach uh, Cuba, move westward to Guanajacarias and launch themselves off again uh, to uh, go to the Yucatan, for instance. A number of songbirds will do that also. Guanacarives is uh, important for uh, snorkelers once again, as well as for migrants. It's a wonderful place. Here is uh, one of the reason, one of the hotels, Mary the, the Chubby. Um, welcome to uh, the snorkeling center, the diving center, center for Interna um, international diving center. It says over here, and here are the. Cuban banders, they're banding songbirds. I think this was a blue grosbeak, beak and they were banding. This was the last day of banding in the late fall of um, 2016, I believe it was. Yes, it was right before the 2016 elections. I remember that well. And uh, here is the uh, visitor center of the National Park of Guanajacarives, where we meet one of their uh, key staff members, uh, Osmani Borrego, he's um, assistant director of the Moana Hakamidas National Park. And here, as you can see, we're giving him coloring books, bird feeders, bird calendars, a couple of uh, binoculars and other stuff for him to uh, engage in education. Um, it's moments like these that I kind of think I'm channeling uh, our late friend, Betty Peterson, who is head of Birdis Exchange who kind of pioneered in this kind of effort and who created lots of friendships in Cuba, including a close friendship with Niels Navarro, uh, the author and artist of uh, a method book on the field guides to the endemic birds of Cuba. Anyway, you're looking at some birds in the, that area. Also, another place to go to altogether is the North Coast here. Um, the North Coast of Cuba, um, hosts a number of uh, resorts, and Cayo Coco in particular, and uh, tourists will fly in from uh, France or Italy or Great Britain or Canada. It's an all-inclusive event. For them, it might as well be Aruba or Barbados or Nassau or Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic. Um, all-inclusive hotel, very nice hotel, rooms, pools, food, food, and did I mention food? It's like a cruise ship that has landed and is not moving. Uh, it's a nice place to visit, but very 
un-Cuban. We go there, however, sometimes to show the people the contrast between the locations we have visited and this kind of all-inclusive resort that Cubans have developed uh, to bring in hard currency. But we also go there uh, to see West Indian whistling duck, which is usually uh, an easy bird to see, a uh, Cuban gnat catcher, which we probably saw before, and Bahama mockingbird, which is one of the, this North Coast is one of the rare, one of the unique places for this particular species. We'll also see other birds we've seen before, including a uh, great lizard cuckoo, which is one of my favorites. Uh, here's what we see on the North Coast and Cayo Coco and other places. We see development. They're putting in new hotels, they're putting in new roads. They're driving over and building over the mangrove swamps. Uh, this is a, a road which wasn't, this is a road in 2016, which wasn't there the year before. Uh, here's uh, one of our trans tour um, guides by the name of uh, Raydell Ray, we called him. This was 2016. And here he is with a pair of binoculars. And you know where he got the binoculars? He got it from us. He had a little pair of binoculars. Uh, we gave him this replacement. <laughs> he gave his binoculars to the bus driver, who was also very observant. Um, more on that particular later. Another place to go is Baracoa. As I mentioned, Sole's favorite place on the island. It's the opposite of the North Coast. It's underdeveloped, it's neglected, it's, it's undervisited which in some cases, and so let me add details later, is a good thing, but there needs to be a, a balance. Baracoa is very interesting. As the sign says here, it's uh, beautiful, clean, and uh, healthy. And uh, it has a, a classic uh, old harbor. It's a lovely city. It's the entryway to the National Park, Alejandro Humboldt National uh, Park here where we enter and make a visit. It's the, I believe it's the second largest or the largest national park in Cuba, I'm not sure, um, but it is uh, densely um, forested, densely forested location. And one of the last redoubts for ivory billed woodpecker uh, in Cuba. Here we are with um, some of the staff. Uh, this is, I can't remember, this is 2017, I think. Uh, this is uh, Giovanni, the park director, myself. Uh, this is El Indio, is his nickname. He's one of the rangers. And our friend Noel Vist, who's the specialist in uh, snails, polimitas. And what they're holding are feeders of one sort or another, a hummingbird. Uh, oh, this says 2016, so that tells us which year it was. Hummingbird um, uh, calendar, etc. And we were. Uh, Walking through the park, at one point we had to cross a, a shallow, virtually a shallow river. Uh, some of us walked across and some of us were taken across in this particular ox cart, which was waiting for us. It was a fabulous time, as Sole can tell you. Some great birds there. Um, my photo of Cuban uh, green emerald, um, Cuban parakeets there, and of course the famous palomitas, the snails of that region in Cuba. Another one of uh, the specialties of the area of the park itself is giant kingbird. It's a great kingbird on super steroids with a very thick bill. Um, it's a fascinating, um, fascinating kingbird that uh, I always enjoy finding. Baracoa also has some old buildings. This one was the hotel, I'm told by Sole. Even though we stayed there five years ago, four years ago, it's closed now. But we all, always bring, and the, the green shows you, material to share with our counterparts. Uh, this was one of Sole's colleagues, a, a, a librarian at the, um, at the hotel, in, and, excuse me, at the library in Baracoa. We provided her with books and a number of the uh, hummingbird uh, calendars there. And here it shows you some of the, uh, uh, difficulties in maintenance. Um, one of the buildings below the hotel had a roof that collapsed. I thought it was from the hurricanes, but it was just for age. A constant problem in Cuba is, main, is maintenance. Uh, they don't have enough wherewithal uh, to repair all the buildings. And uh, a lot of that 
the building material is, uh, is rationed. Now we go for a little aside, if I may, uh, because the area, that part of Cuba, as many other parts of Cuba, have a particular problem I want to focus on. It's a conservation problem, and it's an aside I'm going to discuss just for a minute or two, the bird trade. This is in the streets of uh, Baracoa. Uh, these are two uh, peddlers peddling uh, cage birds, and they're wild birds that they caught or their kids caught and are selling to, uh, to folks. Um, it's a real problem uh, that we have to deal collectively with our colleagues. Here we are in uh, uh, the town of Holguin. Holguin. Uh, this is Sole over here. Here's our friend Carlos Peña. This is Ernesto, as our sometimes guide. And this is Lourdes Peña. I believe it's a sister. You can correct me. And here is Lord's, Lourdes. I think it's uh, Carlos' sister, that is. And here's Lourdes showing us some of the posters they have to discourage the bird trade. Now, is it illegal? Yes. But it's like, you know, is jaywalking illegal in the United States, whether it's maintained or sustained or, or uh, whether the police actually um, go after you is another question. Here are some pictures from Holguin um, of um, a Cuban bullfinch in a, um, in a cage, uh, just walking the streets, just taking a picture of uh, an open doorway of, uh, of uh, birds in a cage. It's, it has become an, almost a status symbol of middle class or upward mobility in Cuba. You are well to do enough that you can not only feed your family, you can feed a cage bird. It's a status symbol that you've made it, which is unfortunate. On the left is uh, yet another uh, Cuban bullfinch at Playa Larga. On the right is a yellow-faced grass quit in Santiago. Here's another Santiago um, bullfinch and another Cuban bullfinch in Santa Clara. And in Havana, uh, Cuban grass quit and uh, lo and behold, indigo bunting, one of our indigo buntings that uh, ended, up, ended up in a different cage. Um, I would say that there's, because of the work of our good friend Michael, uh, in the Havana area, uh, there has been a stricter law forbidding uh, cage bird trade in the greater Havana. And uh, we'll have to speak to Michael to see how well that's being run. There was a wonderful article in National Geographic this last April called All for a Song. It's about uh, the bird trade in Cuba. And it has some of our uh, good friends and colleagues quoted and photographed in this and the problem of the bird trade. Enough of that uh, sad uh, aside, but I also wanna stress this, and since some of these photos were in green, that we are working with our colleagues in terms of a bird conservation message that they have to carry to their their fellow Cubans, particularly through the youth. And we'll touch on that in a few minutes. Lopez de Coyantes is over here in National Park, uh, which is the National Reserve, a park in the Escambre Mountains, a beautiful area, hilly area. Uh, I bring that to your attention because it was the site, as my t-shirt indicates here, of the 2017 Birds Caribbean uh, National Conference um, that occurs every Two, two years. Uh, here is the 2017 logo of one of the trucks which took the participants from one uh, location to the other. This is uh, one of the uh, ancient, not ancient, the 1950s hotels that was built before the revolution with uh, 200 plus rooms, um, with a spa, a restaurant, five gyms, a cabaret, a thermal swimming pool. And after the revolution, it was used um, for a uh, tuberculosis patients. We had a lot of our meetings in this uh, hotel and it's uh, currently used for other medical purposes and generally is not open to tourists. This was an interesting visit. This is the Topes Coyantes uh, areas that we visited and uh, some of the locations and you can see how steep the hills are in our birding 
We saw such wonderful birds as the Cuban grass, uh, Cuban toady here, an, an endemic in Cuban grass crit, another endemic. And lo and behold, in terms of our interaction in green, this is uh, uh, the bag of material that my wife and I brought in one suitcase. I see three binoculars, about eight hummingbird feeders, one or two cameras. Um, this is a a a field um, shower. This is a field shower here done by Coleman, and it's an absolutely ideal bird bird um, bird bath particularly in the North Coast where fresh water is hard for birds to come by. And our friends and colleagues have used it, not as a, not as a field shower, but as a slowly dripping bird bath into a uh, pan below. This also is a picture of, of uh, a, a copy of Ken Kaufman's field guide. You may be familiar with it. You may not be familiar with the fact that Ken had a number, I think 2000 of them translated and printed in Spanish which we've used more on that a little later. Lessons for today? Well, it's not always easy to yank out lessons for Cuban birding and for Cuban engagements. I mean, it's the whole question of who will take you. There are a number, there are fewer groups that take you because they all have to be registered with the State Department. One is uh, the group that I'm most closely related to and, and work with Sole, her group, the uh, Friendship Association there. There's um, the Caribbean Conservation Trust, which used to have uh, regular trips to Cuba. I think since the pandemic, our friend Gary uh, Markowski has reduced the number of trips he's run to Cuba. And our good friend um, from Optics to the Tropics, uh, Joni, um, has also um, trips, um, delegations, not trips, delegations that go to Cuba to interact in terms of stuff. Um, you've got to have the right transportation. We often use this particular bus in particular. Um, and we have to you have to have the right driver. This is our friend Sobe. And notice the pin. These we bring these pins to Cuba. I'm sorry you can barely see it, but it's the cross US and Cuban flag, which we give to our to as many of our colleagues uh, as we possibly. I would highly recommend that you look at uh, a PBS Nature show that was that's called Cuba and the Accidental Eden. Eden, the Accidental Eden. It was done about ten years ago, but it's still very valid and very good. Um, it gives you a feeling for the balance of development and and natural life in Cuba um, and bird life and turtle life, coral reefs, etc. It also gives you the warning that um, there are situations in terms of tourism. Once tourism bursts again, the Chinese are still ready to build a series of golf courses where we once had natural habitat. They're ready right now to do that. I bring to your attention this fine book by Niels Navarro. This is Niels over here at, uh, in Palpite at, uh, at uh, the location for um, the hummingbird backyard, among other things. This is his endemic birds of Cuba, which I'll raise here also. It's endemic birds of Cuba. And it's also in Spanish, lo and behold. That's because for everyone that you buy in English, and this is published by Sole and her, her outfit, um, the uh, Proceeds go to buy part or all of the Spanish version so she can give them away to our counterparts, including teachers and students on the island. Um, it's really a terrific project. There it is in English on the left and in Spanish on the right from the Ediciones Nuevos Mundos, which Sole is uh, the kingpin of. She runs a great operation. Here's, a, here's the interior of the book. And this is Niels Navarro's artwork, which is particularly fabulous. It's, it's the only book you really need. If you know your North American waterfowl, shorebirds, and waterbirds, that's fine. You don't need anything else. You can go with this book and you'll do very well. There's another book, uh, a classic by Orlando Garrido and Arturo Cano, 
which is the field guide to birds of Cuba, here in English on the left, and uh, the uh, University of uh, Cornell University Press has done it on the uh, has done a version on the right in Spanish. There still may be um, available. And here's uh, Ken Kaufman's field guide in English on the left and in Spanish on the right. You notice I put it in green. It's particularly helpful for our Mexican colleagues, but also helpful uh, for our, our Cuban friends. Um, it's a fine book. Um, in English, you'll see the topography of birds, you know, and um, in the Spanish version, you'll learn that corona is crown and cola is tail and punta de ala is wingtip. And you might actually learn a little Spanish here and there using a kind of book. Speaking of great books, this is what uh, Sole has done in her Ediciones Nuevos Mundos, and she'll tell you a little bit about it in a few minutes. Uh, this is Coloring My World, uh, the Cuban parrot. And this is both sides of the cover, both front and back that's stretched out. Um, she also has done um, an annotated checklist of the birds of Cuba every year. And I include this photo of Soleil on the left here. And um, our friend Ernesto in the middle and Joni Ellis on the right. There's a little story behind this. Sole and I were in a bus, leaving, having left Zapata Swamp and going toward Havana. That is, we were going north and west. Meanwhile, Joni and Ernesto were taking a group, uh, another delegation from Optics for the Tropics, going from Havana eastward toward the swamp and toward other places. We, read, we met each other on the highway. Them going in one direction, we're, we're going in the other. So that Sole could, you see that bag, that bag that she's, that plastic bag she's holding, she could give them the extra coloring books <laughs> that she had um, left over and she wanted to make sure that Joni could distribute them when Ernesto was their delegation. So that's the kind of cooperation and interaction which is ideal and which we do all the time. Handing this over now to Sole, for a few shots of the young people and the coloring books and the t-shirts. Over to you, Sole. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sure. Oh, well, uh, Paul, thank you, that was great. Uh, I don't have a lot to, to add to it, um, except that this is, uh, these are photos of, of um, some of the projects that we're supporting. This in particular is in the Santiago area. Uh, with our friend Ines. And uh, again, that's our coloring book. We've actually done four coloring books and we're going to do a fifth, uh, all on endemic or endangered species of some kind. The fifth one is going to be on the mangroves. It's a totally new, different uh, part of, of the work, but uh, something that's very important. And these same children have been part of a campaign to um, of planting mangroves in the areas where they've been, with it, where they need to be planted or need to be repopulated. So uh, that'll be very exciting. We hope to have it finished by the end of the year. And you'll also see the t-shirts that um, I think uh, Joni made those, Joni Ellis yeah. Optics for the Tropics made these t-shirts and they were presented to some of the children sometimes as prizes or one thing and another. And also the um, ed educational materials, all different kinds of educational materials that we give them year after year after year, hoping that they will learn to love and protect, especially the birds and um, discourage their parents and their brothers and sisters from having caged birds in particular. But in general, to protect the environment. What does the uh, what does the T-shirt say, Soli? Tell our friends. Oh yeah, más libres, más bellas. Uh, the freer, the freer we are, the more beautiful we are. And then down at the bottom, it's protect them, protect them, protect the birds. And here and they this? are. Yeah. Well, Paul Paul brought that telescope, right? This body. <laughs> yes. That old bowel scope on the right was given to me by a friend in uh, 
in, in uh, from Annapolis um, years ago, and I gave it to um, uh, Betty Peterson at, at the Curtis Exchange, and lo and behold, um, it has reappeared in this photograph. I do nothing about it. You know, bioscopes, you can you can run over them with a truck, and they'll still last. I mean, they're just wonderful. And As you can, you can see, the them. kids get really excited about looking at birds through through uh, binoculars or a scope or whatever. It really makes a big difference. And uh, we've brought a lot of uh, binoculars and a couple of spawning scopes, projectors for for slideshows. And what is the what is the sticker on the on the little girl on this the left side? This is volando. We're better flying. We're happier flying. Terrific. So yeah. like, this sounds it like is. just amazing work uh, that you're doing down there. And we could listen to you guys all night, I but know. I'm afraid we're coming to, coming to the, end. the uh, end of our time. And I just, um, um, there are a couple of questions out here. I wonder if, uh, if y'all could answer. Well, um, sure. One let's, of them let's, is- We only have two more slides and we just whipped through these two. Oh, okay, sure. So like, just tell the just story quickly, about these are, so these fun. are. These are, this is a mural. We have a, a whole mural campaign throughout the country. Um, it kind of went a little slowly because of COVID, but it's picking up now. And these are murals that are encouraging, again, people to uh, let the birds fly free, to not, do not put them in cages. And uh, this particular mural was sponsored by the Cape Cod uh, Bird Club. Um, unfortunately, they wrote Cape Cop Bird Club. <laughs> But we decided to leave it like that. It's just, uh, and this is the one of the artists, and this is Ines on the left, uh, our wonderful Ines, nature, who is who is at the head of these uh, projects with the children. And, and that's it. <laughs> and here we are on New Year's Day. A bunch of us on New Year's Day, uh, uh, two thousand seventeen, I think it was, and uh, at. Playa Larga, a bunch of us. And there's Sole with a, a parrot. It is not a captive parrot insofar injured. as that it's it's an injured parrot. In He's injured. Yeah. So there we go. Thank you very That's much. That's it. We're finished. Molly, over to you. Sole and Paul, thank you so much. That was really great. And Sole, the work you're doing down there is is just amazing. Um, so one question uh, we had was the four areas that um, you mentioned uh, at the end. Um, when do you go to those areas? Are they parts of regular standard trips or are they separate trips? Sometimes, Sully, correct me, sometimes we've added it. I've been on trips where we've done the core three locations plus Guanajuato Bias. I've done a trip where we've done the four core, three core locations and um, the North Coast. Uh, it's kind very of. difficult to do them all because you're talking hundreds of miles at some point. And I think really to, to do all of Cuba, you've got to visit many. I've been from one end to the other, and I've got plenty more to see. I've been there a dozen times, and sully has been there dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Yeah. And another question, uh, uh, Sole, who funds the production of your books? Delegations, exclusively. So the people who come down on the trips? Yeah. 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 And are there restrictions of where you can take people in Cuba uh, birding? The only restriction in terms of traveling in Cuba is uh, going to a military installation. Other than that, you can go anywhere, anywhere in Cuba that there, we go off road. Uh, we go to, no, you can go anywhere that's not a military installation. And another question for folks that wanna go, um, is there a lot of red tape for going? Uh, I know that, you know, restrict, you know, there are various restrictions um, and you do need to go for the most part on organized tours if you're coming from the US, although you can go on your own if you like through Mexico or somewhere else. but. What is the situation for the delegations that you all work with? Actually, it's much easier than it was about 10 years ago, much easier for us now. Um, 
The only difficulty, the, ma the major difficulty right now is uh, fuel shortages and blackouts, which is makes it's uncomfortable for the for the for the customers for the clients. But uh, in terms of going there, we do all the work. We get the visas. We get that we we do all the arrangements. So for the for the person who wants to go, all you have to do is pay your money and show up at the uh, at the uh, Fort Lauderdale or where the airport or wherever we meet. Uh, but it's it's actually much easier than it than it was in the past. Yeah. And we're going next year in January. If anybody's interested, you, you have my email on the bottom there. Or ask Molly how to get in touch with either of us. We got a couple of slots open. Right. And we're we going we'll in January. The, yeah. And we're doing the we're doing the the circuit the core the, locations. The first core, the core locations. Now we may do a an add-on, what do you call it? An optional afterwards for some people if they want to. I'm going to stay behind and uh, I may do an add-on. And what's the add-on for, Sole? Well, it would be to go to Baracoa. Okay. <laughs> so, but uh, again, it'll have to, it, it, we'll have to talk about that. So it's uh, not easy. It's sorry, not that, I mean, traveling across the country is not easy. And you have to be a, a pretty sturdy person to to want to do it. Uh, it's like two days overland there, two days back. It's not it's not easy, and it's and Baracoa is very difficult because there are a lot of blackouts. There's no fuel. This is very difficult. It's very isolated and very difficult. Okay. Any other questions out there? You can feel free to uh, unmute yourself and speak speak up if there are. Well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think y'all answered all of it. This, uh, so and oh. Paul, thank you so, so much. This was great. Um, loved you. it. Thank you so much for taking your time to do it. We really thank appreciate you. you coming.